Shalom, good morning, YouTube. Good morning, subscribers and commenters. I uploaded a couple of videos lately about SHTF because before I never felt it was that big a deal and I've always said in my other videos uh, prepping is just a good idea in general and I think it is because things happen like Katrina and wildfires and not earthquakes much but like flooding and so if you're prepped for an emergency then when that emergency happens you're ready to do something besides just be a victim um, and I think that that's part of just being a, a human um, it's part of being a believer and it's also part of being an American because pioneer spirit etc so uh, this is, videos kind of ramble a little bit because I've been you know taking in a lot of information in the last couple of days I wanted to start off with the protein because my last two videos have been about protein basically the African swine fever virus that has killed 30 million pigs in China um, and in other parts of Asia and obviously in parts of Africa. Now, pig is not the number one meat eaten around the world, goat is, but there are large populations like China that eat a lot of pig. Um, I don't think there's much pig eaten in India, just saying. But with their you know, main source of protein gone, they're gonna need to fill a protein need. And already some people have posted that, I think it was Australia is sending over breeding pairs, and I forget if it was of pigs or cattle, to China to kind of fill the gap. And so I was thinking about that this morning because in, my, in yesterday's video, I talked about, you know, our goats. We only have three because, you know, Pastor and I are getting a little long in the tooth and we don't wanna, I've had as many as 13 here. Um, several milking nannies, a couple of pygmies. Well, now we're down to just pygmies because I can milk them. And Pastor and I, you know, we don't need as much milk as the whole community does. And they have multiple offspring. Uh, the one nanny that I have in there had three kids last year, twice, I think. Um, if not last year, definitely the year before. And then we have a new little doe who already was pregnant, but she, um, the billy goat was beaten on her pretty bad over some food and she aborted uh, her, her baby and I don't know if she had one or two. I wasn't doing that kind of thing. But suddenly, if there's going to be a protein shortage in the upcoming months, given the evidence of the flooding and the loss of the cattle in Nebraska, I forget how many years ago that was, um, a couple of years ago in a really bad storm, 120,000 cows froze to death. These three goats become a little bit more important, and that occurred to me yesterday. They may be a source of protein for Pastor and I. They could be a source of protein for people in the community who don't have a way to store protein. And then I was thinking today as I was washing dishes, you know, Israelites, we don't eat pork. It says we're not to touch the, the carcass. Um, some Israelites think they can go ahead and raise pork and then sell it, and some do, and then get convicted that they don't want to even do that. But for people who don't mind raising pork, imagine what's going to happen if you raise your, you know, two pork, two, five, you know, your little pork operation. Um, if there's a worldwide demand for pork, and you have your two or three little pigs and you, you know, raise them to 250, 300 pounds and then take them to market, you should be getting a pretty good price for them next year. And since there's gonna be a shortage, if you had a male and a female, you may wanna think about breeding them because they have, what, 10, 12 babies at a time? I know wild pigs, they just breed like crazy. They have, I forget exactly the number, like 100 babies in a year. Um, you could be making some serious money just as a backyard breeder. Multiple people have said that China bought Smithfield hams in Virginia, um, and they're just gonna you know, send all the pigs that are bred in those farms back to China. If they do that, 
then the price in America is going to go up because the demand in America is going to go up. And you know, uh, Americans, they don't want to give up their bacon. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we have people in crisis over their faith because the Bible says not to eat that meat and people just can't give it up. So that's a thought I had. And then my other thought while I was washing the dishes was about chickens. My chickens now are, you know, getting a little long in the tooth too. They still lay eggs, but not as many. And so my, my thought process for next year is get a few chicks, you know, keep the, the flock kind of moving along, I guess. Um, and then I thought, if there's no pork and people are going to try to fill that protein gap, there's going to be more people wanting chickens. Are these hatcheries going to be able to keep up with the man? Are some of the bigger hatcheries like Murray McMurray going to sell out of chicks because people are trying to fill that gap? And it's early right now for someone like me to order chicks. I don't have a way to keep them. Well, I do. There is a way to keep them off the grid. But I'm not mentally ready to do that yet. I don't want to raise them right now with the hardest conditions to get them up to speed. I want to do it more in the springtime and it'll be easier. But you people with electricity at home, if you get an incubator, and I don't know if TSC's carrying them right now, they usually have them seasonally too. You could be making chicks right now. You could make yourself chick independent if you have your home flock with a rooster and they're laying eggs right now. You could start hatching chicks and avoid shortages in the big commercial hatcheries. So that was one of my thoughts. And then the next thought after that is, and then sell your chicks locally. And you're gonna get a good price for them, demand. And I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those, uh, the sky is falling people. If you go back to my videos, you see that I don't say, oh yeah, uh, something's in the wind or things like that because I really haven't thought there has been anything in the wind until this year. When these signs are really, really huge, that demand next year definitely should, I'm not making a prediction, but you know, common sense would go up. So you might want to think about that. If you've not been someone who's been raising your own chicks and you've been ordering them online, you might want to think about raising them yourself. It's not that hard. It only takes 21 days and the incubator does most of the, the work for you anyway. Um, and we've, I know people who have raised chicks off grid. They just use a, a mason jar with one of those little candles in it, um, in a bin. It keeps the jar warm and so the chicks go around the jar and that's enough. Now you have to keep that going like 24 seven or put your chicks in your car. When the sun's up, your car warms up, the chicks will stay warm enough in there. So that's my, my off grid tip to you all. If people can do it that way, and I've known people who have, then you can do it in your comfy garage. So, so what if it smells for a little while? We're talking food for you right now. So that was the one thought I had. Then I thought, some people may see this, this swine fever as sign of an end time or an apocalypse. I don't know if that's, you know, necessarily true. We've had a, <clears throat> and it's all over the Twitter sphere. I don't know if it's on Instagram or not. I um, haven't checked about, you know, how heroic these guys were for um, subduing that terrorist before the police shot him. And I thought, yeah, they are. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about the fact that these guys were heroic, you know, charging at a guy with knifing. Uh, it looked like just a whole pandemonium um, pile when, when these guys got involved. But think about that for just one minute. Think about the actual events for one minute. You have a terrorist person who is knifing people to death because he killed three people before these other guys subdued him. And somebody said the Narwhal guy was a South African, which if that's true, makes perfect sense because there's a lot of violence going on in Africa and South Africa right now. And so he's kind of attuned to it and you know, it's gonna take action. And the nar narwhal tusk was a replica. It was at the Fishmonger's Mall. Um, you know, 
some sort of decoration and he nabbed it and, and brought it with him and helped to do the guy. One, that narwhal tusk is five foot long and it looks just like a rapier or some sort of sword. Just keep that in mind. Um, and when was the last time people used swords to defend themselves? We're talking a couple of hundred years. So London has kind of reverted back. It's gone back in development. That was something I thought about. Really, guineas? Come on! Hey! Stop it! Gee, Manitlis. And here comes a dog. Um, another thought I had was, <clears throat> how many attacks have there been now? Because I had stats in my in my live stream, and I hadn't <clears throat> I hadn't looked in a while. So I went and I just did a quick Google search, London knife attack statistics, and one of the first pages that came up had in its um, opening sentence 15,000 attacks since the beginning of 2018. In two years, 15,000 attacks. Now that's not 15,000 homicides, that's 15,000 assaults of different kinds. Including homicide. 15,000. So think about that for a minute. 300 and what, 65, 52 days in a year divided into 15,000? That's multiple. 6 into 15 twice, so that's at least two attacks a day, if not more. In London. I don't know if that included all of England, but England's not that big. So if you translated that to our United States, we're talking multiples bigger, it, you know, as a ratio. How many they had compared to how big we are and how many we would have to have in order to be equal to those statistics. Aren't they already in a kind of apocalypse? I mean, isn't that kind of ridiculous how often these knife attacks are happening? And people say it in, on Twitter, and it's true. If you've been alive longer than, you know, 10 years, you will have noticed. London, England, didn't used to have that many knife attacks. So two things happened that made that, precipitated that. One was England outlying firearms for private citizens to own. So if you cannot get a firearm, or you're gonna, you know, illegally get a firearm to commit your crime, what do you have to fall back on? What other weapons are there? Well, you're starting to talk like the medieval days. You've got handheld weapons like knives and, and hammers and baseball bats. And that's supposedly better than a firearm. Okay, so take that thought a little bit farther. Would you rather be shot or stabbed with a narwhal tusk? I'm just saying, I think one of them is going to be a whole lot more painful than the other. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that either one of them is painless, but I'm saying if you think about the mechanics of the whole thing, dang. So that was something. Um, and is that almost not like being without rule of law? Because if you're a normal average person and let's, let's just be straight up about this, it's middle class people and lower class people more than likely who are being attacked and young people. The rich people, the elite, when they're in their cars and you know going to their special shopping stores and all that, they don't get this kind of stuff happening to them. So it's kind of like a war on the lower classes. Um, is this not like without rule of law? If you cannot normally expect to just do what you do every day, go shopping, walk across that bridge, you know, eat at the pub for lunch without worrying about being attacked by a knife-wielding assailant. And the second part of this crime spree happening is the influx of the Muslim immigrants. And it was all crazy. I think most of that happened last summer. Just tons and tons of them being allowed in to all these European countries. Oh, we're helping them, we're saving them, whatever. And the crime rates just shot up. 
it's the it's a classic case of two separate cultures that don't necessarily get along. The Muslims are all about being a Muslim, following Islam, having their religion, and living according to that religion. And what it's done in the countries where primarily they have the power is it's kept them in the medieval day ages. If you look at how life is in Yemen and Afghanistan and, and uh, Uzbekistan and stuff like that, most of those people are living a medieval existence. And then you have the few exceptions in the bigger cities where it's, you know, a little bit more up to date. You have that coming into very modern societies like Germany and England and Norway. And they're two belief systems that don't get along. And everybody, you know, there's social media saying, oh, we can all get along. We just have to be nice to each other. It's not working. 15,000 knife attacks in two years is not a sign of this working. It is a sign of it not working. And it's a sign of, in my mind, without rule of law. Because you're, these people are not safe in their everyday lives. It's, it's like a war. So that was a thought I had today. And then, obviously, we are not having that in America. We are not having the same level of crime happening here, but we all can defend ourselves. That's one of the things that keeps people from wanting to prey on us. It's what kept Japan and Germany from invading America in World War II. They sent spies over here, and they saw that we had firearms in every household, and we used things like raid on cockroaches, and they said, there's no way we're going to beat these people. They use chemical warfare on bugs, and they're all armed. So they, it, it didn't happen. And that's, that's a very glaring, obvious fact that people want to ignore. Another thing that people were saying on, on the Twitter sphere was, wow, it's so good that that terrorist didn't have an AR-15. And that's, if you just look at it in that very narrow vision, yes it is, because he could have sat on that bridge and just shot as many people as he had ammunition for. But the bigger picture is, if he was legally allowed to ha have an AR-15, then everybody else around him would be legally able to be armed, and somebody would have put a stop to him, possibly before he killed three people and wounded three more. Arguably, maybe not. Arguably, it, there may have been a higher number of, of wounded or killed. But generally speaking, in America, so many crimes are stopped by concealed carry um, or open carry citizens because the police are not everywhere all at once. We have a very large country. To have police everywhere would, it's probably would double our population and there would have to be a, you know, a police officer every 50 feet. We're way too big for that. So it's imperative that we are armed because our safety is really on our shoulders first. The average response time for a police officer to, you know, a 911 call is 20 minutes and a lot can happen in 20 minutes. Hey, excuse me. So that was one of my thoughts. <clears throat> Being armed is what is saving us right now. London is in without rule of law, in my opinion. The protein in the world is, has been reduced. There's going to be more demand. That is something I thought about today. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Nope, I think that about sums it up. I'm looking forward to your comments. I want to know what you guys think. All right, bless you all. Thanks for listening in. Shalom.